Hello and welcome again to the Writer Review. This is Eric Kurat Writer, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2006 animated family comedy titled Open Season. Now, Open Season runs for one hour and 26 minutes long. It is directed by Jill Colton and Roger Allers. The script was written by Steve Benchich. Ron J. Friedman, and Nat Muldin. The screen story was done by Jill Colton and Anthony Stachy. The story was done by Steve Moore and John B. Carls. It was produced by Michelle Verdoka. It was composed by Ramin Jawadi, who did the score. And the songs were composed by Paul Westerberg, and it was edited by Pamela Zeigenhagen Shefland, and it features the voices of Martin Lawrence, Ashton Kutcher, Gary Sinise, uh, Deborah Messing, Billy Connolly, John Favreau, Georgia Ingle, Jane Krakowski, Gordon Tutusis, Patrick Warburton, Cody Cameron, Danny Mann. Maddie Taylor, Nika Futterman, Michelle Murdoka, and Fergal Riley. The year 2006 saw a major influx of animated movies where the animal characters seemed to follow a similar pattern in terms of behavior and demeanor. In the case of the more domestic ones, they don't want to stay in the habitats that they originally came from and will do anything they can do to return to their cozy dwellings. However, the more autochtonal animals are not very happy when uninvited intruders invade their domains and will stop them by way of acting territorial and vigilant against their adversaries until the antagonists get their comeuppance in the end. You see that in a lot. It's kind of a bit of a cliche. Here, there's definitely no exception, as I will point out later on. Their ways of dominance ends up having the villains humiliated, annihilated, and even getting destroyed. Yeah, they may be cute at first glance, but when provoked, you don't want to fuck around with them. They can be lethal. They could be destructive. They could be primal. And they could be sheer dominant. Now I know this is supposed to be animated. You're supposed to suspend your disbelief. The underdogs will always somehow remain triumphant in the end. And... But when they do get their vengeance... You better come prepared... Or you will be destroyed. They're not taking shit from anyone. In open season, we meet a bear by the name of Boog, voiced by Martin Lawrence, who lives in a garage of a forest ranger. One day, he was forced to live in the wilderness, like all bears are supposed to. After getting into a bit of mischief, and now has the undaunting task of living in a surrounding that he's not fully accustomed to, and has to survive the wilderness while hunting season is in full operation in a couple of days, and relies on all the woodland creatures to help him get through so he won't become a comfortable cabin rug if the hunters do plan to kill him. Of course, he's not happy with his new surroundings and pretty much mopes most of the time. Yes, you see, ever since he was a cub, he was raised by Ranger 
Beth, voiced by Deborah Messing. I mean, she has him pampered. I mean, he, he sleeps in a nice, warm, cozy garage with his little teddy bear, Mr. Dinkleman. He gets fed these kind of, like, something similar to, like, dog biscuits. In fact, he's almost treated domestically, almost like, like her owning a puppy dog or a cat. Oh, and he also does tricks for the local, for the kids who come to the national parks. You know, he does his little unicycle act while juggling or whatnot. <laughs> I wonder how many whippings did he have to take to get on that? Yeah, I know, I know, it's animated. But if you really actually want to know something, one of the reasons why I detest going to circuses especially ones that involve animal acts. If you've ever looked through the history of Barnum and Bailey and Ringling Brothers, you'll know that those animals are, ver are treated very, very horribly. I don't want to talk too much about it because it just really fucking breaks my heart. Come on, I try to run a clean show here. But, you know, like I said, circuses are just not my thing. And I don't condone animal abuse of any sort. If you're so much, if you're for animal abuse, you're no friend of mine. Get the fuck off my channel. Anyhow, anyhow, you know. Let's face it. Boog lives the life of a almost like, not necessarily quite like a king. But he gets treated very, very well. Almost like the way how, a, how an owner looks after a dog or a cat. Beth really does take good care of him. And he's not really adjusted to the forest life. I wonder how she actually got him into his house. You know when cubs are around and mama bears watching over them? You never, you never touch their cubs. Because if Mama Bear sees that she's going to get so pissed off, she's going to maul you to death. She don't fuck around. She's not going to take any of your shit. Don't, and no, and don't, and no point of running. She's quite lethal, and bears for their size are actually very agile. But for some strange reason, she adopted him. Oh, and, the, and what's so, also so ironic is that the movie was set in Timberline, Idaho. Now, I'm not really particularly in a, a know-it-all when it comes to law, but I did read somewhere, I've done my research... And I noticed that Idaho, which is where this movie is taking place, well, it's taking place in an animated world, but it it's actually set in the city of Timberline, Idaho, which is the only state in America, believe it or not, that actually allows you to legally adopt a bear for a pet. Well-known facts. Look it up. I do my research before I do my broadcasts. I didn't know it before, but now I do. So Boog is pretty much so... And I'll get more into the story arc as we go along. So in the traditions of all animated features of this caliber... They continually put on the morals, the messages, and all the repetitive themes to ensure that when kids get older, they will become upstanding citizens in the near future. And that's what I kind of like. I'm kind of, I mean, I'm more for about encouraging over indoctrinating. There's a difference between encouraging and indoctrinating. Encouraging is you can't really hold them by the hands forever. They have to make 
these kids have to make their own decisions of how they wish to go through in life. That's called encouragement. And doctrinating is practically like forcing and shoving it down their throat. It's like you can introduce a kid to broccoli, but you can't like shove it down their throat. You may tell them that broccoli is essential for a healthy system. That and they decide themselves that they want to eat broccoli or not. That's called encouragement. Indoctrinating is actually like trying to force it down their throat and making them chew it. That I do not condone. So I don't mind the morals and all the messages and the, repeated, and the repetitive themes to ensure that when kids get older, they will become upstanding citizens in the near future. But like I said, all these morals and all these messages, all these lessons learned in this movie, well, it's, I'm not saying that it's superficial, but it's up to them to make the choices of their own as to how they wish to go through in life. And even though I'm not really complaining that I want their messages to remain positive, but there's just so many morals in open season that it becomes tedious and overwhelming. It teaches you the values of friendship and trust, even though in the real world, Boog and his friend, Elliot, who is a mule deer, voiced by Ashton Kutcher, well, they would not necessarily be friends. Oh, Boog would love Elliot, but not as a friend, more as a meal. Because Elliot is a mule deer. He's a deer. And I don't mean like a friendly deer, like, how are you, deer? No, a, the, as in the animal. You know, where the males have antlers, where they're called bucks. And Boog is a grizzly bear. They would never be friends in real life. Oh, sure, Boog would love him. For dinner, maybe, but... Anyhow. I'm trying to... I'm trying to... To contrast... Animation from reality. Sure, it also teaches you... To respect one's surroundings and environment, because let's face it, let's face it, intruders, intruders invading one's environment is still generally trespassing. And if you go into the wilderness to either camp it out and rough it out in the woods, you know what you're doing? You're basically trespassing. This is the home of the animals. And you decide to chop down your trees and build your little campfire. But, but while in the real world, these woodland creatures would be scared of us. Oh, but not in the animated world. They're actually badasses. And will destroy you if they, if, if they have to. It also teaches you the values of accepting the people you love and who loves you back. And also the value of becoming independent. When we first introduced to Boog, like I said, he's a pampered, domesticated bear under the care of a forest ranger named Beth, voiced by Deborah Messing, who has fed him, taken care of him, and has been subservient to his needs and wants. Oh, and also when he lets out his little bear screams, she does it back, and even more, more scarier. He likes to attract the tourists at the National Park by putting on shows, by doing tricks like the unicycle act, which the audience seems to enjoy, which I don't. It's is actually just petty exploitation. He truly enjoys the attention that's given to him. Boog's life changes, however, forever. 
when a crazed psychotic hunter who goes by the name of Shaw, voiced by Gary Sinise, he arrives on the scene in his dingy, unkept pickup truck and is carrying a deer with one antler strapped on the hood. By God, I'm going to tell you right now, Gary Sinise as the voice of Shaw and the character of Shaw, he, I mean, I know I should not be sympathizing with villain characters, but by God, Sinise as Shaw, let's just face it, he's even more backwards accent than his Lieutenant Dan character in the Forrest Gump movies. I mean, I mean, you know, after all, he's a he's a hunter who rides around on his big old pickup truck, and he carries them along with deer. And I'm here to do some hunting. You know, I mean, he really. I mean, sure, as cliche as it seems, but he's the kind of character who makes the story, you know, all the more interesting. Being that he is the leading villain in the story. He has no sympathy or remorse in his blood. Hunting is his passion. Shaw claims that he ran over the animal. Which if he got his way. It would have been stuffed as a trophy case. And his head would be hanging on the wall. Yes, Shaw is just one real warped up, crazy ass motherfucker. But you know what? I'd rather be entertained by watch. I mean, Shaw definitely, I mean, in many ways, he kind of reminds me a lot. Like if you put Yosemite Sam, Elmer Fudd, and the Tasmanian Devil... And maybe even possibly Wally Coyote. In a blender you get Shaw. Because that's who he kind of reminds me of. He reminds me of a lot of Bugs Bunny's main antagonists. Which include, you know, Yosemite Sam, Elmer Fudd, Tasmania Devil. Or any other antagonist that Bugs Bunny has often dealt with in the past. Shaw is kind of almost a bit like that kind of role. You know, intimidating, scary, badass, resilient, resourceful, but also very unfortunate. I could also pretty much say dumb, but maybe he's not, he's not that dumb. Or maybe he is, I mean, he's not really that lucky when it comes to hunting. But he never gives up. I mean, it's just in his blood to, to hunt for the game. The one, ant the one antler deer appears to be still alive that was, uh, that was tied to his truck. And Boog kindly breaks through the rope. And the one antler deer, like I said, his name is Elliot. Voiced by Aston Kutcher. Is very grateful to Boog. And that in return, he wants to be friends with him. Even though Boog really doesn't want anything to do with him at all, period. Knowing that, and knowing that Elliot, who is... Just one annoying little asshole. You know what? I wouldn't want to be friends with him either. The trouble is, Elliot is, you know, a bit hyperactive in character. And his influence wears on Boog. As well as they get, as well as they start to get into trouble. To the point that Boog and Elliot are taken by helicopter into the deep wilderness 
and now Boog has to become more independent and has to depend on survival instincts in order to survive in hopes that he will return to his master, Beth. You see, it all started off when Boog was asleep into the garage, and all of a sudden, Elliot comes tapping at his um, at the garage door and tempts him with candy, which eventually means that they start raiding a, a convenience store. And they practically trash the store. And then the next day when... And then which eventually leads to... Boog end up getting, ends up getting... Uh, almost like drunk from, uh, from candy. Yeah, he gets a candy high. Or a candy hangover. Because apparently candy... Makes him drunk. Oh yeah. And then. When uh, he was about to ready to. Do his little performance. He starts chasing after Elliot. But the people. Back when the people in the audience. Saw like. Like the shadow movements. Of Boog and Elliot. And it looks as though. As if. Elliot was maul was getting mauled by Boog. And it looked kind of graphic. So then uh, Sheriff Gordy, voiced by Gordon Tutusis, tells Beth that maybe we be it would be best if he and Elliot would be taken into the forest. That maybe his days of being domesticated has worn off. And now Boog, who has never adjusted to forest life, feels that this is not his home. His home is back in the garage with Beth. But however, Elliot's spontaneous demeanor is much to the chagrin of Boog as he tries to help him adapt to his new surroundings, even to the point of teaching him how to go to the bathroom in the forest. Oh yeah, did I ever mention Boog is toilet trained? And I don't mean and I don't mean surrounded by newspapers and a sandbox. I mean he actually sits on on the poo poo throne. The porcelain. Yes. The porcelain throne itself. But hey. Elliot says. You want to know how to go to the bathroom in the forest? No. Simple. Just let yourself go. Nobody gives a fuck. Hey, what the language? Oh yeah, and he also, and he also, lets out a few nuggets for our viewing, for our viewing pleasure. But all the while, Boog is sulking because he just wants to go home to his comfort zone. And he blames him for blames Elliot for being in this mess in the first place. I everything that has happened has been Elliot's fault. And you know, he's right. But I don't understand why I'm 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 feeling all that sympathetic towards Boog because believe it or not, Boog isn't really that any better than Elliot. Sure, Elliot's a pain in the ass. But Boog also gets on my nerves too. But in a different way. It's like this movie, the protagonist in this movie can be actually quite unlikable. Boog isn't any better than Elliot. He's annoying and being sanctimonious and self-righteous in character. 
This is not my home in the forest. I want to go home to bed. At first he thinks of the woodland creatures as mindless, vulnerable animals who are submissive to these hunters, and he couldn't care less if they survive or die. Oh, as long as he can crawl back to Beth's hospices, this is what really all he cares for. And as Boog and Elliot are joined by the other forest creatures, beavers, squirrels, porcupine, and more, They are all hostile to them at first. Hell, even Elliot's own fellow deer tribe is also not particularly that happy to see him. I mean, you have you have squirrels throwing acorns at them. You have the, the other deers getting physical to Elliot. You have the beavers working on their dams. I mean, I mean, they're not exactly particularly that friendly with intruders, even if it happens to be fellow animals themselves. But once they get adjusted and once the hunting season is underway, they eventually turn their attention towards the hunters they become allies to Boog and Elliot in their quest to take the hunters down. And then came the, the climax. The climax at the end saw the last hunter that was uh, there is, of course, Shaw. Oh, of course, we also get introduced to Shaw's cabin, which is full of uh, animals that he has hunted. Some of them are on mantle pieces. Some of them are are stuffed and uh, yeah pretty uncomfortable sight so let's see at the end like I said Shaw is like ready to point the gun at uh, at Boog he shoots at Elliot we at first are led to believe that Elliot is dead Boog eventually responds by turning towards his more primal instincts and it looks at first as though as if he's mauling Shaw but then in the end all he does is he takes his gun and some rope and starts tying Shaw towards his his wrists and his ankles and then eventually he ends up getting uh, Shaw ends up getting uh, dosed with with honey and feathers um Two campers who go by the name of Bob and Bobby, who are out looking for Bigfoot, eventually think that they caught Bigfoot. So they tied Shaw to the hood of their car and drive off. And then, in a very tender moment, Beth returns and and Boog now has to make the decision as to whether he wants to go back to Beth or if he wants to stay in the forest. Boog decides to stay in the forest. And Beth goes off. Now this movie, believe it or not, actually launched three more direct-to-video movies which were not very good. And I'm not saying this movie was really that spectacular either. But the other three were worse. And now you're going to probably wonder why I think this movie is not that good. The red herring to open season is that the script lacks in plot. While it plays it safe to avoid from being overly saccharine while at the same time is lacking in anything exciting. It's like all of those old Saturday morning cartoons where the underdogs always win. The two main protagonists are really not that likable to get invested in. 
one is an annoying moper and the other one is just was just hyperactive. You can't really get invested if your protagonists are really that not that likable. The villain Saw may have a psychopathic integrity in him, but his intelligence is lower than room temperature. But then again, if I want to see a psychopathic hunter with an intelligence synonymous to room temperature, I may as well just watch a Bugs Bunny or Sammy Sam cartoon. At least Yosemite Sam has character. The only real character that really stands out for me is the character of McSquizzy, voiced by Billy Connolly, a short-tempered squirrel with a Scottish accent who provides most of the funny quips. And while it feels cliché, but the rise since the beginning of animation that bears I described as playful, cuddly softies. Yes, Billy Conley, of course, talks like that in real life. Hmm. To all the people and to all my Scottish friends, I'm sorry, but I just can't help it. His voice is very addictive. We can't never see. We can't ever see an animated. I mean, why can't we ever see an animated bear who isn't a playful creature? but a dangerous omnivore who could be aggressive when provoked. I mean, come on, haven't we learned less, any lessons from... I mean, come on now. Not every bear has in cartoons have to be like Yogi or Barney. Okay? I wish we could see a bear that's not portrayed as, you know, big and dumb and cuddly. Because in reality, bears are are not that cuddly. They're cunning, they're dangerous, and when they're provoked, you don't want to piss them off. Because if, if you do, you're totally, you're fucked. Sure, I know this is animation, we have to suspend our disbelief, but the whole notion is so goddamn cliche. It's ridiculous. But the thing about the relationship between Boog and Elliot, one is just a freaking stick in the mud, while the other one is so goddamn hyperactive. You really don't want to hang around with these two. I mean, Elliot was the cause for all these trouble to begin with. Shaw should have finished him off. But since he's so dumb... He never succeeded. And if this was reality, Boog would have made Elliot a dinner instead of a friend. Maybe he might be better off hanging around with Beth. But even her role is just bland and boring anyway. That also might be out of the question. So when all is said and done, if I was to give this movie a scale out of 10... I would give Open Season a 5 out of 10. I'm sorry, it just didn't stick very well to me. I mean, there's just not really too many redeemingly good qualities about this movie. And maybe I gave it a 5 because the other three direct-to-video sequels we're not any better either. And they also deserved a place in the lower tier of the rating system. And I guess that's all I have to say. So I guess this ends my ride review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my YouTube channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment. Go right ahead, but just remember the three simple rules. Be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And I will be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric and Rock Rider saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around.
Goodbye.